Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to today's section. This particular section we are continuing on with our the last session which we had carried out on pyrexia of unknown origin. Last time we had defined pyrexia of unknown origin and enumerated the diseases which cause pyrexia of unknown origin. Today we carry on with bacterial zoonotic diseases which present to you with as PUO or pyrexia of unknown origin. Now what is a zoonotic disease exactly? A zoonotic disease is a disease that can be very commonly transmitted between animals and humans. Though various diseases can be transmitted, in today's topic we are concentrating on the bacterial diseases which are transmitted between animals and humans. Now globally there has been climate changes, there have been overuse of antimicrobials and closer interaction with animals which facilitate the emergence and re-emergence of bacterial zoonotic infections which are becoming more and more a fact of life and we are seeing more commonly zoonotic infections because of close interaction between humans and animals. Farmers and animal health workers especially veterinarians are at increased risk of exposure to certain zoonotic pathogens. Now these pathogens can be transmitted to man through animal bites and scratches. They can also be transmitted through contaminated animal food products specifically improper food handling and inadequate cooking of food which has come in from animals. Vectors frequently arthropods such as mosquitoes, ticks, fleas and lice can actively or passively transmit bacterial zoonotic diseases to man. Soil and water which are contaminated with manure containing a great variety of zoonotic bacteria can also transmit zoonotic diseases to man. Now the common bacterial zoonotic infections which we come across are brucellosis, leptospirosis, salmonosis which we studied in the last session, bubonic plague, psittacosis, tularemia, Lyme's disease and campylobacter infection. In today's session we will be discussing the first two that is brucellosis and leptospirosis. Now starting with brucellosis, a 40 year old veterinarian presented to the hospital with complaints of fever off and on 3 weeks duration anorexia, profuse sweating, malaise, headache and myalgia of 2 weeks duration and weight loss of 1 week duration. On clinical examination, his pulse was 90 per minute, pallor was present, no rash was seen, blood pressure was 90 by 50 millimeters of mercury, per abdominal examination revealed an enlarged liver which was 1 centimeter smooth and regular, spleen which was enlarged 2 centimeters, the lungs, cardiovascular system and the CNS showed no abnormalities. So investigations were planned for the patient, his hemogram was done. In the hemogram his hemoglobin was low 10.9 grams per liter, the rest of his parameters were almost near normal, no leukocytosis was observed, platelets were within the normal range, ESR was raised. The biochemical investigations done were the total protein, the aspartate transaminase, the alanine amino transformase, the total bilirubin, the urea and creatinine. So these are tests for renal function and for liver function, they were all normal. Then microbiological investigation was started keeping the bacteria which cause pyrexia of unknown origin in mind. Serum was, blood was collected in a plain bulb, serum was separated and tests were done for diagnosis of typhoid, malaria, dengue, leptospirosis and rickettsia. All these tests were negative. Then the rose bengal test was done for brucellosis. The buffered acid rose bengal antigen interacts with the serum and it produced agglutination in this particular patient. So it was a rose bengal test positive and this is the type of agglutination we saw with this rose bengal test. ELISA, IgM and IgG for brucella were also positive which gave us a more indication that probably what we were dealing with was brucellosis. So the standard agglutination test was done, test serum was diluted in a series of tubes, a constant defined amount of the antigen was added to each tube and incubated at 37 degrees centigrade for 20 hours. Antibodies in the serum agglutinated in the presence of antigen and clumped at the bottom of the tube. The reading was taken at 50 percent agglutination. This is what the standard agglutination test looks like. This particular patient had a titer of 1 in 160, 
this was the tube which was taken as the last tube which gave the agglutination. So, a provisional diagnosis of brucellosis was made, patient was started the treatment with doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day per orally and rifampicin 450 milligrams per day also orally. In the meantime, culture was attempted, 5 to 10 ml of blood was collected for culture in a castaneda bottle containing brucella broth and triptychase soya broth and brucella uh, or uh, and brucella heart agar. This is the castaneda's bottle, this was the agar and this was the broth. Now, 5 to 10 ml of broth uh, mead was in inoculated into this particular bottle. The broth was tilted weakly on the agar and subcultures can be made from liquid onto broth in this way without con causing contamination. From the liquid subcultures could also be made onto agar plates to get an idea of the colonies. It was incubated at 37 degrees in 5 to 10 percent carbon dioxide. Subcultures were made every 3 to 5 days on the agar slope only. Only when colonies were seen on the agar slope were subcultures attempted onto different other media. The other media which was used for growing the organism was the sheep blood agar on which subculture colonies at 48 to 72 hours were punctate and non hemolytic. So, this is a picture of colonies of brucella grown on sheep blood agar. Smear was made from these colonies, the organism was gram negative, cocobacillary, non motile, non sporing. It was oxidase and catalase positive, no carbohydrates were fermented, nitrates were reduced to nitrites. Indole was negative, MR and VP were negative, citrate was negative, but ureas was positive. This is a picture of the smear of the colony, gram negative cocobacilli was seen in the colony smear. Now, to differentiate which brucella species it was, because all these five characters so far was pointing towards brucella, various tests were done to find out which particular brucella species was infecting this veterinarian. The tests which were done was growth for carbon, carbon dioxide requirement. It was not necessary, the organism could grow even in the absence of carbon dioxide, which again pointed to either melitensis, suiz or canis. H2S production was not done by the organism, growth in the presence of certain dyes such as thionine and basic fuchsin was attempted, growth in the presence of thionine was not seen, while growth in the presence of basic fuchsin was seen. So, it was likely to be brucella melitensis. This is commonly transmitted to man by sheep and goats and there are various three biotypes of brucella melitensis which can infect man. Similarly, Brucella abortus, Swiss and Canis are obtained from cattle, pigs and dogs respectively. Seven biotypes of Brucella abortus are there, five of Brucella Swiss and one of Brucella Canis. Other tests which could be done in this patient, a smear was made from the bone marrow and was stained with Gimsa. Tiny cocobacilli was seen in the smear as shown in the picture. It was also stained with ZN stain and you could see acid fast bacteria in the ZN stain. The picture at the bottom shows the acid fast bacteria from the ZN stain. So, the isolate was confirmed to be Brucella melitensis. The patient was put on doxycycline and rifampicin, which had been already been put on it. The same two drugs were continued. Other treatment regimes which could have been attempted in this patient are doxycycline along with streptomycin, cotrimoxazole along with rifampicin or gentamicin. So, these are alternative treatments where the patient responded well to doxycycline and rifampicin and they were continued. Now, brucellosis is essentially a zoonotic disease. Other names for this disease are Mediterranean fever, Malta fever, undulating fever. Now, it goes by this name because David Bruce first isolated it from the spleen of a fatal case in Malta. The name brucella came after Bruce and the name melitensis came from the Roman, Roman name for the place Malta. Its virulence is attributed to its ability to resist phagocytosis its ability to survive intracellularly specifically in the reticular endothelial system. It has two antigens, the A antigen and the M antigen. The A antigen is present in abundance in Brucella abortus and the M antigen is present in abundance in Brucella melitensis. Infection is usually acquired by man through the intestinal tract, through unpasteurized raw milk or milk products, or direct contact through skin, mucous membrane or conjunctiva. This is usually seen in veterinarians, butchers and animal handlers. Inhalation can also occur in laboratory workers who are working with brucella. The incubation period of the disease is roughly 10 to 30 days after you acquire an infection. The pathogenesis of the organism occurs due to the entry of the pathogen into the lymphatic channels. From the lymphatic channels, they go to the local lymph nodes, there is intracellular multiplication. They enter into the bloodstream resulting in bacteremia. 
from the bloodstream they go back into the lymphoreticular system and the placenta. Clinical features of brucellosis can vary. It can present with only latent infection where only serological evidence is present of brucellosis infection, but no clinical signs are present. It can present with acute brucellosis which is more commonly seen in brucella palatensis. Varied symptoms may occur with fever, you may get muscular or articular pain, sweats, anorexia, constipation, nervous irritability and chills. Complications of acute brucellosis could be articular complications, patient presenting with arthritis, acute arthritis, osseous complications, visceral complications and neurological complications. In chronic brucellosis, there is surprisingly no pyrexia. Patient presents with sweating, joint pains and overall lassitude. The animals who are infected can also be diagnosed with brucellosis, so that specifically those who are dealing, keeping breeding animals should keep a track that their animals are not infected. It can be done microscopically in pathological specimens by immunofluorescence test. It can be done by the same serological test which we have done for diagnosis in humans that is the Rose Bengal test and the SAT that is the standard agglutination test or more commonly in animal cattle it is usually done by the milk ring test where whole milk is taken and a drop of brucella stain antigen is added to it incubated at 70 degrees for 40 minutes. The antibodies in the milk agglutinate the antigen and it rises to the surface and form the ring as shown in the picture. So, the picture on the right shows the positive test, the on the left shows a negative test. So, that is how the milk ring test will occur and you can do it for cattle which are being bred in various stay places. Now, how do you prevent brucellosis from occurring? Basically education about the risk of transmission specifically to people who are handling with animals like farmers, veterinarians, abattoir workers, butchers, consumers who are using non-veg food and drinking milk, hunters etc. They must be told to wear proper attire when dealing with animals. Specifically, if they do not know if the animal is infected or not, they must make sure they wear gloves, masks and goggles whenever they are dealing with animals or their discharges. They should avoid consumption of raw dairy products, check dairy animals for infection, vaccines should be given to the animals specifically where they are being bred, brucella or water strain 19 for cattle can be used and attenuated life strain is also available for those who are at occupational risk. Vertical transmission. Uh, is also been seen from mother to child and sexually transmitted brucellosis has also been seen from husband to wife, specifically veterinarians, wives who are coming to you with complaints of fever, you must keep in mind brucellosis and test them for brucella antibodies. The references for the images have been shown here, they have been taken from various presentations on the internet and I would like to thank all the authors whose images have been used for this particular presentation. Now, I go on to the next zoonotic disease that is leptospirosis. Now, this particular patient of leptospirosis presented a 35 year old female who was a paddy worker came to the hospital with complaints of fever of 10 days duration, headache and sore throat of 7 days duration, yellow color urine of 5 days duration. On examination, her pulse was 110 per minute, BP was 100 by 70 millimeters, temperature was 39.1 degrees centigrade. Sclera was yellow, pharynx showed little reddening. On examination, no, lymphadeno, no, no lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly was seen, but there was grip pain on the gastronemous muscle and it was observed bilaterally and small PTK was also seen on the left lower leg. The respiratory system CVS and the central nervous system showed no abnormality. On investigations, leukocytosis was seen. There was an increase in the polymorph, so it was a polymorph for nuclear leukocytosis. Hemoglobin was little less, so patient was anemic. The serum bilirubin was raised to 6.2. Other parameters in the liver function were not markedly raised except alkaline phosphatase, which was remarkably more than what was expected in a serum bilirubin of 6.2 milligrams. The alkaline phosphatase was 540 international units per liter. The blood urea was also slightly raised, CRP was also raised, platelets were normal, urine parameters were again disturbed, WBCs were present, occult blood was present and proteins were present in the urine. So, there seemed to be some amount of renal involvement in this patient along with jaundice. Again this routine test which are done for diagnosis of fever, specifically in a patient who was showing signs of jaundice were done for this patient, ELISA, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Syphilis and HIV infection were all negative. 
rapid diagnostic test were negative for malaria and dengue. The uh, peripheral blood smear showed no malarial parasite. The Vidal, Brucella and Wheel Felix were tests were negative. Blood culture was negative for bacteria. Urine sample was collected from this patient, it was alkalinized, centrifuge at high speed, examined under the dark ground microscope, actively motile spirochetal organisms were seen, 15 to 20 microns by size by 0.1 micron, their ends were hooked and they resembled umbrella handles. This is a picture of what you can see under the dark ground, you can see the hooked um, uh, ends of their leptospira which are seen under the dark ground microscope. So, this give us, gave us an indication that what we were dealing with was probably leptospirosis in this particular patient. The urine deposit was also stained with lividity stain and you could see dark brown uh, spiroketal organisms in the urine deposit. When it was stained by the gram stain, we could see weakly gram negative organisms even on the gram stain. Then a serological tests were attempted for leptospira diagnosis, 5 ml of venous blood was collected either in a plain bulb or vacutainer, the serum sample was separated, ideally paired serum sample should be obtained, the time of collection of the two samples should be the first sample as soon as possible and prior to antibiotic therapy. So, the first sample was collected in this patient and he was advised to come back for a second sample after an interval of at least 7 days. Rapid tests were first attempted on the serum sample, so we could get a confirmation of diagnosis of leptospirosis. The first test which we did was the macroscopic slide agglutination test, which was an in-house test and showed clumping of the organisms in the side in which we had added the antigen. The other is a control to show that the antigen does not agglutinate on its own. So, the macroscopic slide agglutination test was positive using the leptospira antigen grown in-house. The indirect fluorescent antibody test was also positive for leptospira. So, this gave us an indication that what we were dealing with leptospirosis. Other tests which can be done for a rapid diagnosis are a commercial test the lepto dry dot which again shows agglutinated blue colored particles in the dot. Then ELISA IgM for leptospirosis is another test which was done to confirm a diagnosis of leptospirosis. So, with this provisional diagnosis of leptospirosis, patient was given penicillin 1 to 2 million units 6 hourly for 7 days. The serum was sent for confirmation for macroscopic agglutination test to the national center at RMRC Andamans. The micro microscopic agglutination test is the gold standard for diagnosis of leptospirosis since leptospirosis are difficult to cultivate. Where zero R and zero group specific antibodies are determined, this is usually done at a reference laboratory as a large panel of zero R's live organism need to be maintained as antigens and it is technically difficult as each dilution of the serum which to which the antigen has been added needs to be seen under the dark ground microscope to look for clumping. Usually a titer is taken to be positive if it is more than 1 into 200 for a single sample or you look for a four fold rise in titer between paired samples. So, this is what the clumping of the bacteria look like under the dark ground once the antigen has been added to it. The antibodies in the patient's serum agglutinate the antigen and they cause clumping of the leptospira. So, instead of seeing single isolated leptospira with curved ends which we had seen in the dark ground microscope when we saw the urine sample, we see them as clumps like this. So, this is what is look like a microscopic agglutination test looks like. This particular patient, the sample was sent for microscopic agglutination test to RMRC Andamans and it came back positive in a titer of 1 in 800. Samples for culture was also attempted, both the blood and urine samples were collected for culture. 3 to 4 drops of blood was inoculated into Biju bottles containing EMGH medium, the EMGH stands for Ellinghausen, Macklinghaw, Johnson and Harris out of the people who devised the medium. The leptospira disappear from blood after the first week of illness, so this would be positive only in the first week. So, in this particular patient, we did not get any leptospira growing from the blood. The midstream urine sample was collected, alkalinized at the bedside, it was double centrifuge, first at slow speed to settle the larger particles, then at high speed and then the deposit was inoculated into EMJH medium. The urine is likely to get contaminated unless inoculated immediately or 5 percent fluorouracil has to be added to the medium, so that before it can be inoculated. The organisms are difficult to grow and require the presence of albumin and serum in the medium before they can grow. They grow best at 30 degrees centigrade in the EMGH medium, it takes approximately 3 weeks to grow. 
So, that is why treatment has to be started on a suspicion of, of leptospirosis based on microscopy and serology. The medium containing rabbit serum such as Fletcher's, Korthov's, Noguchi medium can also be used if EMJH is not available. Simple tap water with rabbit serum which is Fletcher's medium can be used for growing leptospirosis. Samples from culture are examined every third day for presence of leptospirosis. If you are inoculating it in a tube, you will get a dinger's ring on the surface of the tube in a semi-solid medium. So, this is what the dinger's ring which shows the growth of leptospirosis looks like which is just below the surface. So, it is a sub surface growth of leptospirosis. It is very difficult to grow leptospirosis as colonies on the surface of medium, but here we attempted to grow it on the surface of a medium containing rabbit serum and we got these irregular colonies on the surface of medium containing rabbit serum. So, these are surface colonies of leptospira. Biochemical characterization of leptospira can also be done to confirm a diagnosis. They are catalase positive as shown in the figure at the top. They are oxidase positive again as shown in this figure. They grow at 13 degrees and grow growth at 13 degrees and growth in the presence of 8 azaguanin could differentiate pathogenic and saprophytic serovars. The saprophytic leptospira can sometimes be seen in the environment. So, whether we have got it from the environment or whether you actually got a pathogenic serovar from the patient would require you to test for growth at 13 degrees centigrade. Only the, uh, the saprophytic will grow at 13 degrees centigrade, the pathogenic will not. So, apart from biochemicals, identification can be confirmed by agglutination and agglutination absorption test. Due to a large number of isolates and high degree of cross reaction, identification is complicated by this agglutination test and is restricted to reference laboratories only. Now, why did I say there are so many types of leptospira? Leptospira is a very complex family and a species. It based on their surface antigen, they are divided into two major groups that is leptospira interrogans group and leptospira biflexa group. The leptospira interrogans group is the pathogenic group while the leptospira biflexa group is saprophytic, is present in soil and water and is usually not pathogenic. The leptospira interrogans group is present in natural host in wild and domestic animal and man is incidentally infected. 26 serogroup groups are present. Usually a particular serogroup infects a particular animal. You have icterohemorrhagica infecting rodents, canicola infecting dogs and so on, but this can vary. Now, in these serogroups you have 270 serovars. Now, the reservoirs of leptospirosis are rats for serova ectorahemorrhagia which I just talked about. For dogs they are usually canicola. For cattle, the serotype which is present in cattle is hebdomadis and autobnalis. For pigs, it is serotype pomona. So, so on and so forth. So, generally it is important to find out which is the infecting serovar because it can give you an indication of which was the reservoir from which infection was obtained so that you can take appropriate measures to control the uh, outbreak. In natural reservoirs, the disease is asymptomatic. So, the dog may not actually have any infectious signs and symptoms of infection at all, but he may still be excreting leptospira in the urine. Organisms are excreted in urine and feces. They contaminate the soil and stagnant water and survive for many weeks through intact mucous membrane of mouth, nose, mouth and eyes. When leptospira in water is contaminated by the urine of animals, it enters humans who have either walked through this leptospira, this contaminated water. So, it is either through contact with infected soil or water contaminated with the urine of animals or through cuts and abrasions on the skin and mucous membranes. Through intact mucous membrane of the nose, mouth and eyes also, it can enter into the human body. So, there does not have to be a big uh, wound through which it will enter, can even enter with small through small cracks and cuts on the hands and feet. No lesions are there at the site of entry. From the site of entry, it enters into the bloodstream and it causes leptospiremia. It localizes in certain organs, specifically in the liver and the kidney, or also enters into the endothelium of the capillaries and into the renal tubules. Antibody production occurs and lysis of the organism occurs by antigen antibody reaction occurring in the presence of complement. Finally, the following organs are damaged the liver resulting in hepatitis the kidney resulting in acute tubular necrosis, the eyes resulting in meningitis. It can also enter into the CSF resulting in meningitis, the eyes result in uveitis. Large amount of antibodies are produced at this stage of the infection and sometimes the antigen antibody reaction also causes damage to the vascular endothelium and causes disease. The clinical features of the disease are present with first an incubation period of 1 to 2 weeks. 
patient may be asymptomatic or be in the subclinical phase, specifically veterinarians, packing house workers who are dealing with packing of uh, animal material, diagnosis can only be done by serology at this stage. If the patient is asymptomatic, there is no clinical signs at all. So, veterinarians need to be monitored for the presence of leptospirosis by routine serological testing and icteric leptospirosis. Now, generally whenever we think of leptospirosis, we think of Weiss disease which is the icteric form of leptospirosis. Actually, the anicteric manifestations of leptospirosis are often more common are missed because there is no high index of suspicion by the clinicians. In the primary stage, it might present with non-specific flu-like symptoms and often will not be diagnosed unless you are really thinking of a diagnosis of leptospirosis. In the secondary stage, the patient may present with headache, myalgia, nausea, vomiting and we may even get signs of aseptic meningitis. The icteric leptospirosis of the classical Weill's disease presents with jaundice. 10 percent of these cases of most cases of leptospirosis present with icteric leptospirosis. So, usually the anectric manifestations are more common than the icteric manifestations. Jaundice occurs by the second or the third day, but there is no permanent liver damage. This is usually followed after some time by acute tubular necrosis and renal failure and if not properly treated, patient may die and there is a mortality rate of roughly 10 percent with leptospirosis. The treatment for leptospirosis is essentially penicillin and tetracycline which are useful only if started in the first week from onset of disease because later on the antigen antibodies form and antigen antibody reaction take place and tissue damage occurs because of the antigen antibody reactions. Cefotaxim may be used in the complication of leptospirosis and doxycycline can be given either for therapy or for prophylaxis. Now, how does one prevent and control leptospirosis? Generally use a personal protective equipment when working with animals. Manage effluent disposal by containing it in properly pilled ponds or pits, so it does not come in contact with the soil. Prevent livestock having access to open water sources like valleys, dams, rivers or ponds, because they are likely to pass urine in these water sources and these water sources are likely to get contaminated with leptospira, then people walking in these water sources or drinking this water will land up with leptospiral infection. Protecting clothing or footwear should be worn by those exposed to contaminated water or soil because of their job or recreational activity. Specifically in a rural country like India where a lot of people are agricultural workers, those working in paddy field when they are going for the paddy fields are waterlogged with water and if the rodents come and pass urine in these waterlogged paddy fields, the ladies who are working in these paddy fields are likely to get leptospirosis because of contamination of this water by leptospira. The vaccines are available for domestic animals, inactivated cell vaccine or outer membrane protein vaccine are given only serotype based protection. So, you have to know which are the common serotypes in your area and then work out the polyvalent V which is used to prevent disease as well as urinary shedding. Vaccine for humans are tried only for persons at high risk. We all vaccinate our dogs for leptospirosis part of the routine immunization program, but even a dog who is vaccinated for leptospirosis may be shedding leptospira sometimes in his urine. Chemo prophylaxis with doxycycline has been tried specifically in areas which are epidemic prone. In India, Kankauli or parts of the Konkan region are definitely epidemic prone during the monsoons. So, recently an attempt has been made to prevent leptospirosis in these areas by giving them doses of doxycycline as chemo prophylaxis and many outbreaks have been prevented because of this. These are the references for the images. Most of the images have been taken from the leptospira section of the BJ Kaman Medical College Pune and I would like to thank them for it and one or two of the images have been taken from the internet. So, I would like to thank those people also whose images have been used. So, before I conclude, these are the two classical pictures in which you will get leptospirosis. The picture on the left is a rural setting in which you get leptospirosis that is a paddy field and the woman working in a waterlogged paddy field which could be contaminated with leptospiral serovas. The picture on the right is the, out, the flooding of cities which we are getting in the presence of highway monsoons which we recently seen in Kerala and which we saw few years back in Mumbai and they land up with leptospira outbreaks after that. So, we keep both these urban and rural pictures in mind whenever we are thinking of a diagnosis of leptospirosis and it is only a high index of suspicion which will give lead you to a diagnosis of leptospirosis which is so eminently easy to treat if you think of it well in time. So, just to summarize leptospirosis can be diagnosed essentially by serology, 
culture though it can be done will not play a major role in diagnosis. So, diagnosis has to be done either by a rapid test or by the ELISA IgM and you must keep a diagnosis of leptospirosis in mind when you have a patient presenting to you where you do not have any other positive test. Similarly, zoonotic disease like brucella will also come to you in a similar setup where also the diagnosis is essentially by serology, but the culture for brucellosis is easier to perform than the culture for leptospirosis. So, keeping both these bacteria in mind specifically in the monsoons, whenever you get febrile illnesses, they must be kept in mind for the differential diagnosis of fevers. Thank you.